I guess, with my film critic today, Mike G. And uh, we're talking about films from the 70s or 80s that had an impact. Did you go to movies a lot as a kid? Not that much, but when I did, it was a, it was a humdinger, let me tell you. <laughs> and they had those movies I did go to that I do remember from back then. Boy, they had an impact, all right. What would be the first one? Absolutely, without question, Phantom of the Paradise, directed by Brian De Palma and starring, of all people, Paul Williams. And also <laughs> another actor, I think might have been an English actor, I'm not sure, uh, uh, William Finley. Okay. And um, yeah, it was a parody, satir satirical parody of Phantom of the Opera. Right. It was a rock and roll updated version of it. But Brian De Palma's concept was to combine the horror genre with the rock and roll opera genre, which was starting to become a thing in the 70s. I see. And um, the movie didn't do particularly well financially. Um, and a lot of people from our generation don't even know the movie and have not seen it. <clears throat> but I, you know, in my case, I was taken to it by a friend who was already kind of warped in that direction anyway. The, trig, <laughs> the twig had already been bent and so was growing the tree. And, um, but it was great. I mean, it was, it was my first exposure to the type of music that would become, the, the 70s would become known for, such as like the freaky rock opera, like Queen, I see. Bowie. Um, so you jumped from the top 40 to some more well, challenging I, material. I, you know, I think at that time I listened to like, when I was a young kid, I listened to stuff like Dixieland jazz. And stuff oh, okay. Like that. Okay. So this really was a jump turned. Yeah. Turned my head into the rock and roll direction. So, but, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful movie and it's a shame that more people haven't seen it. Um, mm -hmm. Paul Williams was a very unlikely star for this movie because he was known for composing these soapy ballads for Crocker Bank, you know, and the Carpenters. We've only just begun. You Old know, that, fashioned love song. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that one was a little better, but yeah. yeah. And, and it was a very odd thing, but he, I think he wrote some of the music for this thing. And he wrote um, a really great ballad that is probably the best known song from the movie called um, Our Love is an Old Love. And it was just, um, if you have anybody who's listening to me, search it out and watch it because it's amazing. It's really good. Awesome. Okay. How about the second film? Second film would absolutely have to be Tommy by wow. The Who. Wow. Yeah. And now I have to draw a distinction with Tommy because even though I do like the original concept album that The Who put out, um, Pete Townsend himself will tell you about this. Uh, there was a demo quality about that one. And he kind of was on his own with that. Um, by the time that he had turned around and turned Tommy into a full multimedia feature, including a movie and a new soundtrack, his, the, the idea had really fleshed itself out and it had would really got involved and it had benefited from better instrumentation, better recording, uh, more ideas contributed by the band members. And, um, the, uh, you know, I, I, we were talking about how our parents seem to take a sort of secret delight in taking us to these weird head warping movies when we were kids, you like know, the like, exorcist. Sure. Oh, like, Oh yeah. Well, there's a, there, yeah. That'll, that'll give you pleasant dreams for the night when you're eight years old. Yeah, sure. But, um, it was like that. Uh, Tommy, yeah. Tommy had some very disturbing images in it. Um, and it was a little hard for a young mind to wrap its head around. And, and it, it's funny, when you get to be an adult, you realize what they were really talking about. And it's sort of, you can laugh about it now, but it's like at the time, it was like, yeah. They, they, they put Tommy through all kinds of weird abuse, sexual, psychological, and otherwise. Um, but Tommy is a very multi-layered statement. Uh, it is a very complex work of art in that it talks about some heavy spiritual philosophy, um, some kind of almost cynical 
observations about the nature and human nature and the nature of religion. But um, as a musical piece, it's amazing. And the music on the soundtrack album in some ways was much better than the original album that was put out. And what I appreciated about it was that by that time, Pete Townsend had added a lot of synthesizer stuff that sounded a lot like uh, synthesizer artists that I was listening to at the time, like uh, Larry Fast of Synergy and things like that. Uh -huh. So, you know, and definitely quite was. a cast, right? Yeah, um, man, Margaret, Oliver Reed, and then of course, Roger Daltrey himself, and and most of the members of, of The Who were in it. In Elton John. There. Elton John was in it, that's true. Tina that, Turner. That was Eric, and Eric Clapton. <laughs> and how was the acting with all these stars? And the so most, for the, oh, Tina Turner's scene was amazing. Okay. She was, she burned that thing up. Um, Although she kind of overdid it, but that's what kind of made it made it pleasurable, right? Because or made it you know noticeable is that she just really overdoes it. How about Roger Daltrey? Was he he good was at... actually very good in it. Really? He, yeah, he actually, you know, I hmm. guess it just goes to show that to be a successful frontman in a band, you also have to be kind of an actor. That makes sense. Yeah, totally. Okay, so, the last movie. My last choice would be Logan's Run. Okay. Which was a science fiction movie that's well known to our generation. Um, it, it was about people, it was a post-apocalyptic situation where what was left of society lived in a giant dome city, and the engineers of this society had determined that while you're alive, you could do anything you want, you could live a life of total pleasure, but you had to die at 30, and you had to die in a sort of a ritualistic kind of a carousel they called it it was sort of a ritualistic process that everybody was witness to and everybody cheered it on like as if you were being renewed into something which was total you know total crock of crap and we were only 10 so that seemed pretty old right yeah 30 <laughs> oh yeah those people i think we thought god people who are 30 and older need to die I mean, anybody, our teachers <laughs> all our teachers yeah but of course nowadays it's like yeah but um I really enjoyed that movie. I thought that even though it was not like the book, mm -hmm. um, I thought that stylistically that movie was extremely well done. And it was filmed at um, a shopping mall in Houston, Texas, if I'm not mistaken, a huge place. Right. And um, it was just extremely well thought out. Uh, Farrah Fawcett was in this movie, one of her first movie roles. Mm -hmm. Um Eh, Michael you know, York, yeah. Michael York, of course, who we know from Cabaret. But, right. And also later on was uh, in uh, Austin Powers movies. A great, yeah, cameo. Now, yeah. was there a deeper meaning to Logan's Run or a subtext? No, or? not really. Um, no? Not really. I think if you read the book, you'd get that. Um, I think it was just pretty much a statement about longevity and age and you know, what you can do with your life and uh -huh. what, what, how important it is to really enjoy and savor every moment of uh, living that you have. That's an excellent life yeah. lesson. Peter Ustinov so. was also in that movie and he was the old man that they found who was living in Washington, D.C. alone with a bunch of cats in the Library of Congress. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, wow. you know, when they, when they bring him back to the city, everybody freaks out and he says, you, that hair on your face, it's white. Your hair. It's like, God, I mean, I can just imagine what I'd, what they think of me. What would they think of me if I went back there? And movies were an experience back then because you went to the big screen on oh, uh, maybe a Friday night. You waited in line, sure. right? The sound was very loud. And Movies just were so sensational in the 70s i mean mm. i mean we take we take it for granted now what movies are like but move but back then it was a big deal and the panoramic uh you know anamorphic sure. aspect ratio and the the sound and then of course you know there were movies like uh, earthquake and sense around which they were they actually brought in subwoofers to make the whole theater rattle it was shake it was a big deal yeah, yeah. and and that was all new those were all new ideas back then and right they were extremely exciting but as far as the rock and roll movies both of those movies really seriously influenced 
my thinking and my tastes for many years to come. I see. Much more challenging. Yeah. I'm going to give you a bonus film. Tell me about Rollerball. Rollerball. Oh, man. That was a movie that was actually just based on a short story. And I really dug Rollerball. I, I thought that movie was just so controversial. And it, and it actually must have been because the remake seemed to blanch out a lot of the messages that were in the original film. Uh -huh. Now, Rollerball really did have a deeper message. And that was about the prevalence of corporatism in in our in our lives you know right and, and not just not just american society but global society and how corporations seem to be taken and they, they envisioned a future where corporations literally explicitly ruled the world there was no government like washington dc it was just the corporations and, that, and each one handled a different aspect of life you know there was food and there was energy and and james Kahn played this guy named Jonathan E who was the star player in the rollerball team for energy, you know, the energy corporation or just known as energy. And he, uh, the thing was he showed much to their chagrin that the individual can defeat all odds and still come out the winner. And they didn't like that. And that's what uh. that movie's about. And they make it harder and harder and harder uh, for him to win and almost killing him. But they don't quite get it. They can't quite get it. I mean, they got motorcycles uh, chasing him around. And they, I mean, it's crazy. You think, you know, you think uh, the L.A. Uh, Derby dolls are bad. You, you got to watch Rollerball. And I don't remember that being a big hit either. Was no, it? no, it wasn't a huge hit. Um, the only thing that just a little comment about that movie that is that. Devo, the band Devo, got an idea from that movie um, for their corporate anthem because there's a funny scene in the movie where they play a. It's Bach though. It's not. It's not like Devo music, but they play a Bach piece and they call it the Energy Corporate Anthem or something or something. And Devo kind of stole that idea. But oh, I see. Yeah, but that's that's all I can say. Awesome. So those were the '70s films, and just to kind of put a fine point on it. Wasn't that kind of the decade where the director had control and you had De Palma and all these great directors kind of, you know, having control over the film. Yeah. And, uh, Tommy, for example, was directed by a famous director who was known for very strange films. And unfortunately I'm, I'm, I'm totally blanking on the guy's name, but um yeah, it, it, more this or was less. before the summer blockbuster, is what I'm trying to say. Before uh, all the action cartoons, it was kind of like a cerebral. The films yeah, you're mentioning well, that's true. So, movies of the 70s still had a cerebral quality that kind of got diminished in the 80s and 90s and beyond. Um, and that's unfortunate with because, franchises and yeah, that kind like, of thing, you know, superheroes running around. And you know, I mean, they, they have some interesting scientific ideas they throw around in those movies, but it's not really a message. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just briefly give your, do you want to give your channel real quick before? We oh move? yeah. I'm, you can see our, my videos on Marganon, M-A-R-G-A-N-O-N and not to be confused with Marganon real estate, which, I'm, <laughs> which I'm competing with. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is Mike D and uh, Mike G at downpeppertulane.com. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Bye-bye.